happen. So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us here today at the Smart Industry Conference 2016. Uh, we're pretty happy to be here. We're going to talk about some really cool, really exciting, really innovative stuff all related to this whole Internet of Things concept or industrial Internet of Things, however you want to coin the term. But we're going to focus on the new technologies and the new applications that are available today. So to kick us off, I thought we'd kind of first start off with a survey of where we're at with the Internet of Things. So today, for example, you can run down to the local Best Buy and you can purchase this smart connected refrigerator. For about four to $5,000, you can get this thing parked into your kitchen. It has all kinds of sensors built into it. It will monitor how fast you're consuming your milk, it'll do some predictive analytics, and it'll figure out exactly when you need to go to the store and pick up milk, which is great because who hates you know, getting up in the morning and you don't have milk for your cereal? It's a problem. But this particular smart IoT device takes it one step further and it actually has an IP camera built into it. Pretty amazing technology, right? So when I get home, I get off the plane, I can log into the IP camera in my refrigerator, take a look around and see if I need to pick up eggs. Pretty amazing technology. We're solving real world problems today with all this new innovative IoT technology. So let's stop right there for a second. So I start off the presentation to illustrate a point here. There's a ton of buzz, a ton of hype, a lot of naysayers around this whole Internet of Things technology. So today we're going to dispel with the myths, the rumors, the buzzwords. There's not going to be any paradigm shifts. We're going to focus on real world, rubber meets the road, IoT applications. The technology you need to know about, how you're going to get there, how we're going to bridge this OTIT gap. Uh, we'll focus on that stuff. So the first thing we're going to cover uh, is a quick um, case study on Nick's company, Skata Solutions, and how they connect wind turbines, legacy assets to the IoT, to start generating new revenue streams. So my name is Matt Newton. I'm with Opto22. We're the industrial controller, um, very similar to a PLC, but we do a programmable automation controllers, and we do I.O. modules that are guaranteed for life. So we're an industrial automation company. Nick is a systems integrator with Skata Solutions. They do lots of really cool IoT applications. They're connecting Skata Systems to the internet, very similar to uh, the wind turbine application that we're going to talk about today. So overview, uh, we'll do the case study. We'll do a deep dive on that. We'll get you guys really in depth with how the technology works there. Then we're going to talk a little bit more generally about some of the IoT technology that's out there today that you should be aware of. And finally, I'm going to touch on what I think is probably the most important thing that anybody can walk away from here today, which is how we can actually start bridging this OTIT gap that everyone talks about, getting these two groups to work together. So to make sure we're all on the same page, let's start off with defining what an IoT thing is, because everybody said, you know, it's a ubiquitous term for just about anything, a sensor, a transmitter, whatever. But in the context of this presentation, what we're going to talk about today, an IoT thing or device has three important characteristics. It has the ability to sense the world around it. It has the ability to communicate using internet technologies, protocols, and languages. And it has the ability to perform some type of real world physical control. So the Nest thermostat, and as I realized, everyone uses the Nest thermostat as an example in the IoT story. But it, it's a great way to illustrate a point. So that Nest thermostat, it's sensing the temperature in the room. It's doing some internet communication up to the Nest cloud services. And then when it sees that the temperature inside my room is outside of the set point that I prefer most, it performs some form of physical control with my HVAC system, turns on the electric, the uh, air conditioning system, and brings the temperature back to that set point. Now that's the basics of an IoT device. And if you think about it, if you take a step back and look at what it's really doing there, it's not all that different than an industrial control system that everybody here is probably very familiar with. It's sensing, it's communicating, and it's controlling. So going back to IoT value and that consumer device we talked about, the smart connected refrigerator, I think a lot of people are still struggling with where we're going to get value out of these IoT applications. The majority of them right now are in the consumer space. Don't get me wrong, I love my Nest thermostat. But I think we're still struggling to figure out exactly how we're going to get new revenue out of this, how we're going to get new opportunities out of it. And I think part of the reason for that is that if you look at most of these consumer devices, they were all designed, built, and shipped from the ground up with the latest internet technology built in. They have Wi-Fi security built in, they have authentication built in. It was all designed to talk on the internet right from the get-go. If you think about our legacy infrastructure, all the stuff that we already have out there, the billions of sensors, the control systems, wind turbines, 
It wasn't designed with internet connectivity and communication in mind. So the question is, what would happen if we took these technologies and these devices and applied them to that legacy infrastructure and we scaled up these applications and started delivering real IoT applications? So Nick, let me turn it over to you to talk about uh, your specific application. You want me to advance it? Yeah, I Sure. Good morning or good afternoon. So uh, our first need at the wind sites was that a lot of the legacy uh, owners and operators had no communications. These are old devices that were put in the 80s, uh, basically an HMI at the base of the turbine that was uh, either off, on, or reset kind of thing, you know, very basic uh, instrumentation. <coughs> so we had to first get connectivity to them. So we devised, in a lot of cases, uh, a 900 megahertz radio that provided with uh, four points of I.O. input and output. Uh, this provided uh, start, stop, reset, the basic functionality of the turbine without having to be there. So that gets back to the operations building. At the operations building, now we can put in our Ethernet-based systems. So now we can call out to each turbine, either control them or limit their uh, product production uh, based on what the needs and wants is of the operator. So um, most of this work uh, in this area was lacking in the sense that they would be, you know, either production would fail because they, they didn't know what was going on or it'd be a maintenance, maintenance issue. And unless the guy went out there with the pickup truck, uh, there'd be no way to, to record that or, or bring that data back. And basically it was hand recorded. So this was a, a great opportunity for us to um, bring everything back to that central office and now make it so everything's automated. Uh, with the advent of IP-based uh, switches and whatnot, now we can put that in at the turbine locally and now everything is addressable. And everything now has, you know, all that data can be brought back to a, a server-based uh, system where we can now mash the data and find out analytics and all this good stuff. Again, this is technology that was from the 80s. Uh, was never thought of, never really, it was just get them turning and keep on going. Well, now with the fluctuation in the, the market with uh, pricing as far as the energy market is concerned, uh, these operators that are coming up on their 20-year span of their, their purchase power agreements with the utility is requiring them now to be able to curtail in a very short amount of time. We're talking like 10 minutes on a site that has 250 turbines. Well, if you have no communications, you're relying on Joe and the truck to get out there and push the button, it ain't going to happen. So that was a big push for us because of the, the, the market needs and requirements of now the operator to curtail when commanded to do so. A lot of the energy being produced was not utilized. They would say, hey, look, although you're an eight megawatt site, we're gonna need you to curtail back to four megawatts and we need you to do it in four minutes. So this was the whole implementation of how to get that done, uh, working through the servers and whatnot. And I saw the presentation earlier with the MQTT, the Arlen, Arlen's group is fascinating because this is what we've been pushing to do is get it to where it's published. It's not a polling device. It's now being, you know, it's, I want to say storm forward, but it's on the more of an IP, uh, TCP IP uh, workable platform. Um, so now with all the requirements, too much energy, uh, they have to curtail. We're getting calls from uh, KISO, the independent operators, uh, kind of the Fed regulatory body in California is taking all the information, the wind, the, how much hydro is coming online, how much uh, energy is being produced by turbines outside the, uh, the market, and they said, okay, here, it's uh, 14 cents in the next 15 minutes. So the operators now that are losing their fixed purchase power agreements <coughs> over this 20 year time, and they're required to now have all these abilities to curtail in 10 minutes and address the, the needs or wants of the utility, now are having to play the market because they'll get negative pricing. And there's a perfect example of Kaiso taking all this information in. Um, they'll get the negative pricing in the next 15 minutes. Well, if they don't act quickly, and either curtail on their own accord, or they let everything operate not realizing that it's now at a negative, they're almost ready to have to write a check to the utility, so the utility paying them. So this is this implementation of almost automating the system, although two of our clients are just using it as notification. They're taking the, the 15 minute data that's coming in and looking at supply and demand and that where the spot pricing is gonna be and where it's the opportunity for them to actually keep operating at a profit instead of losing money, perhaps, uh, if they ran for, let's say, 30 minutes when it was negative, although it came back that day, at the end of the day, they're at net zero. 
So uh, this allows them now through um, internet protocols and what we've used to pull these devices, I shouldn't say pull, but uh, basically uh, be able to control this functionality remotely allows them to get ahead of the game and be more productive and bring up production for the entire plant. Uh, along with this is all the you know, like maintenance data and now they're, they have the ability to add a sensor and all these uh, other items that can be added um, allows for remote capabilities that um, normally they'd have to dispatch somebody and in this uh, scenario that he's showing here they get a call in the middle of the night they have to go uh, look at the turbine number seven you know something's not right it's a uh, fault has been recorded it's snowing it's uh, very hazardous terrain to get up to that wind turbine site well now he can the operator can basically take with our mobility platform in his hand and decide whether he needs to climb that turbine or not so there's a metric there of how much is saved, workman's comp areas, we're talking insurance companies, on how much is saved by not allowing that man to climb and safety regards and all that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of data and a lot of, you know, if then kind of situations as far as climbing and maintenance, is it really something I have to climb up there for? Or is it something very simply just, you know, fault it out and we'll deal with it in the morning? So um, with that being said, um, all the different functionality within the nacelle, the, the top of the turbine there that you see in this photo, um, is all recorded with us. All that big data is coming down. We know exactly what's happening with the generator, with the gearbox. A lot of this legacy, legacy stuff had no control whatsoever and especially no information coming down tower. So now we're able to increase the value by knowing that, you know, in five months we're going to have to change oil or, you know, all these beautiful operational devices that are now in the new turbines, uh, we can now do with the older ones and very cost effectively, uh, which was always a big hurdle. Um, and now with the, being able to look at the pricing market and whether it's uh, you know actually better to operate now or not, uh, with all this stuff going to the cloud, allows them to make these judgments and even automate if they want. And for an example, uh, we take, um, the automation setup that we have now with some of these legacy turbines is that they'll take that pricing module, they get the 15 minute look ahead to the operator. The operator can either make that judgment of, you know, figuring out which turbines don't need to be operating. You know, a lot of people ask me, well, you know, I've seen this whole farm, but I, there's only like five of them turning over here and how come these aren't turning? Well, wind doesn't, it's not static, you know, uh, wind comes in different patterns and whatnot. And there's a lot of variables, you know, it's a maintenance issue. Um, it's down for work or what have you. So these things can be mitigated by the big data being crunched and being able to come back to the operator and now he can set points and he can take things out of uh, working or operational workings so that they can be maintained or uh, maybe the KISO is regulating what the uh, power output needs to be. Um, in addition to that, the utility again going back will say, look, we can't take all the power you're producing and you guys need to curtail, and we'll tell you when you can come back online. So now with all these things IP addressable, um, these older turbines that were just meant to spin uh, can now be controlled in a more uh, dynamic environment. And um, it's all the, all the data that's coming in, the big data, and, you know, and I'll be honest, a lot of it is not, no one really knows what to do with it yet, but at least we're, we're polling it, and we're getting to a point where we're able to do things um, in a, more a productive manner rather than a reactive, you know, predictable manner rather than reactionary manner. And so that's uh, keeping the life of the turbines going, it's uh, increasing uh, optimization, it's all the things that they want and love. Uh, and it's changing the model from tearing down that old set of turbines to, uh, you know, and, and assuming another loan or trying to market the, you know, the tax credit deal because we're going to put up new turbines. Instead of doing that, they're just kind of like changing the oil on the old Chevy um, and, and getting the most out of it they can. So um, with that, so, yeah. back to Matt. Thanks, Luke. Maybe, uh, <clears throat> maybe you could touch on just one of your customers and how fast you got ROI on the application and what the dollars and cents revenue look like. So, um, well, production numbers went up in one instance in Palm Springs from um, basically flat to 16 increase, 16% 16 increase in production. Uh, if you monetize that, um, it's going from $700,000 a month in revenue to a million, and it was overnight. So the ROI was realized completely within three months. 
and that was like way beyond what our even our expectations were. Um, always a funny story. I got we were putting it all in, and he came. You know, the, the operator, the owner came to us, who was reluctant at first to do all this stuff. It was quite a retrofit, and uh, he came running to me, and we're in the middle of cabling and programming and all this. And he's like, "Do you know what you've done?" I'm all, uh, I don't know, you know, Hank, you know, my programmer, what, what, you know, I, did, I had no idea what he was talking about, what he had seen already, the increases, and he was just, you know, over the moon about it. So typically the wind energy, if they see a 1% or 2% increase, they're opening champagne. So, you know, when we were doing 16%, it was just like mind-blowing. And these are legacy turbines of, of manufacturers that are, you know, Vestas, the largest in the world. And um, we were able to do this with those, those turbines, so. That's awesome. Thank you, Nick. You're welcome. So, in my humble opinion, folks, that's the real Internet of Things that we got to get to. It's not about consumer devices and wearable devices and, you know, all that stuff is great, but there's a lot of value out there that we can tap into right now. It's all about getting access to legacy infrastructure systems like the ones that Nick is talking about. So, what are some other applications? How about environmental applications? Does anybody remember a few years ago when the oil rig off the Gulf Coast caught on fire and sank to the bottom of the ocean? And several people lost their lives. We dumped, I think it was roughly 3.2 million barrels of oil into the ocean. We totally messed up the environment for who knows how long. Now, I'm kind of a geeky guy. I have to ask myself, if we had some predictive analytics or data acquisition application collecting data for that site and mashing it up with data from other sites, could we have identified maybe an opportunity to improve best practices or make sure that you know the best safety situation was being used? Those are the kinds of questions we have to start asking. That's the kind of IoT application we've got to get to. What about our city infrastructure? I'm sure everybody has heard the news about Flint, Michigan and the decaying water system and how we made a boatload of kids sick with lead poisoning. What if we had a big data package with some kind of lead sensor looking at the water and mashing that data up with data from other cities' water systems to figure out maybe the lead level shouldn't be quite that high and alerting somebody to turn off you know, the water transmission before kids got sick. That's the kind of preemptive action we can actually start taking. But this one is my personal favorite. Manufacturing applications. When I was just starting my career, I could walk into a business park just about anywhere and within the matter of a few days, I could have a decent, honest, you know, decently paid job without much effort. But things have changed substantially since then, particularly in the United States. We've offshored a lot of manufacturing because of labor costs. So I have to ask myself again, what if we applied some of this technology to this type of application? I was at another conference a couple of weeks ago, and I met with a couple of guys from Flextronics, a contract manufacturer uh, out of the Bay Area. And they've got a whole IoT initiative specifically geared towards bringing jobs back to the United States. That's their entire objective. They want to automate stuff, add IoT technologies, just to bring jobs back to the US. So these are some of the applications that they're available right now. We just have to tap into them. We have to figure out how to get two very different groups to work together. But that's the big opportunity we're looking at. There's all of this data out there. It's all, we've been shipping devices like this, electric sensors, relays, control systems for decades. There's a ton of existing infrastructure out there. We just have to figure out how to tap into it, get access to that data, and then figure out what kinds of cool, interesting, innovative things can we do with that data once we have access to it. So I keep talking about data, and there's a reason for that. And the reason is that the Internet of Things, the, the entire concept, it runs on data. It's all about moving data from one source to another source, figuring out how we can analyze that data, mash it up with other data sources, and figuring out things that we didn't have visibility into before. Now to do that, two very different groups are gonna have to start working together. It's inevitable. Now these two groups, they have totally different cultures, they have totally different technologies that certainly weren't designed to talk to each other, communicate with each other, or interface with each other. You might even say the same about the people in the groups, right? They're just very different folks. So who am I talking about there? That is this OTIT convergence problem that I'm sure everybody has heard about. So let's take a look at that and see why these two groups don't get along and how different they really are. We'll start with the OT group. Now, the OT group, this is where we literally wire up physical sensors, actuators, our motors, our pumps, our relays get connected together into a system to actually perform a task, manufacture a good 
transport water, stuff like that. This is where our PLCs live. The stuff is typically programmed in some legacy programming language. And I hope I don't offend anyone when I say something like ladder logic or function block. But this is the world of voltages, currents, it's our sensors, our motors, our pumps, and our relays. Now for this whole IoT thing to work and to get access to that data, this is our data source. We wanna get the data from those systems into our IT systems. That's our core objective. So when we talk about the information technology folks, their applications and their objectives are all designed around data. It's all about how fast can I get access to my data? How fast can I transport it to another system? How fast can I analyze it? They're constantly in a state of upgrade, which means their gear is constantly being uh, changed. So they're yanking out servers, they're slamming in new servers just to get two or 3% more processing power because that's where their competitive edge comes from. It's all about processing data. Now because of that, their systems, their applications, their hardware, their software, it's designed with intercommunication in mind. It's designed for systems to work together, talk to each other, and they do that using open standards and open protocols. It's how the internet works today. So that's where TCP IP comes from, that's where HTTPS, MQTT, that's where our web servers serve up web pages to your smartphones, that's how your smartphone knows how to talk to different applications on the internet, all based on these open standards. Now you contrast the two groups. On the OT side, their gear is designed around a specific application, which means it's often very proprietary, designed to accomplish one task, not designed to interface with other systems. Whereas the IT side, it's a little bit different. But our objective, remember, our data source is our OT stuff. Our motors, our pumps, our relays, we wanna get that into our IT systems. That's the, the objective that we need to focus on. So what we're really talking about doing is moving that data to the cloud. We're trying to get our data into the cloud because in the cloud, we have infinite computing processing power, infinite storage. Now there's a lot of uh, you know, images out on the internet about what the cloud is. You know, you've got infographics like this with you know, monitors connected to gears and somebody's head and cute little pictures like this with washing machines talking to dryers and all that stuff. I'm sure that's very interesting. And some clever marketing guy, he slapped this IoT thing on top of it. Now we've got this whole new market that everybody's chasing called the Internet of Things. So, what is the cloud really? This is the cloud. This is a data center somewhere. It can be anywhere. It can exist literally anywhere. Google's got them all over the place, Amazon, Yahoo, all of them. This is where we, we have literally like infinite computing power. We have tons of processors, almost infinite. We have tons of processors. We have tons of memory. We have access to applications, systems that we can spin up and spin down literally in minutes. That's how the cloud works. It's just a data center and it's designed to analyze and archive data. We wanna process it because once we, we process that data, we identify patterns, we can figure out how to improve processes, we can figure out how to make our businesses more competitive. So when we talk about data, a real good barometer to use to see if somebody actually knows what they're talking about with this IoT stuff, and I did steal this from somebody else, but I thought it was great. When they reference big data, they're gonna talk about big data as a problem because it is a massive problem. If you go back in time with me, say 15 or 20 years, to when the internet first started rolling out, everybody was getting online, you wanted to share photos with your family, you wanted to send emails, maybe you were downloading music, but you had this tiny little pipe to do it, a tiny little 56K modem, it was absolutely maddening. I, I still hear the sound of that dial-up tone in my nightmares. But uh, the problem there was that our infrastructure wasn't designed to support the amount of people that were coming online, the amount of data we were actually moving across the internet, the infrastructure just couldn't keep up. Now, when you look at that problem and you multiply it by the billions of devices we're all talking about connecting to the internet, think about the latency problems that we're gonna run into. Our infrastructure just isn't designed to do that. Now, in these IoT applications where they're mission critical applications, for example, the oil rig, if it catches on fire, we don't have time to interrogate the cloud and deal with any kind of latency to figure out if we should you know, put the fire out. We just have to be able to do it at the local level there, at the, at the control site. We can't have latency like that in these types of applications. So that's where this concept of edge or Cisco's coined the term fog computing comes into play. They're basically the same thing. Edge is a little more general term. But what we're talking about there is taking some of the intelligence that resides in the cloud, some of the, the smarts, the data processing capabilities, and we wanna push it right down to where those physical electrical signals 
come into our, our PLCs and our automation controllers. We want to push that smarts right down there because then we can pull in the data, we can filter out what we need, and we can push up just the information that's necessary to perform our application. For example, a refrigeration system at Costco. We don't necessarily need to report the temperature in the refrigeration system every 500 milliseconds. Maybe we just need to average it over five minutes and then send that one packet up. That would be much easier to do. We'd use a lot less bandwidth that way. The key to these edge or fog computing devices is that they've got to be able to speak both the OT languages and the IT languages. Because you've got to be able to pull the data in using an OT language, like an electrical signal or an OT protocol like Ethernet IP. But we've got to be able to convert that into what the cloud understands, our online systems understand. And that's a digital bit or a digital byte. So that's in the form of TCP IP. So it's got to be able to speak both languages. So when we talk about internet communication, you know, we're starting to see this type of technology filter down into the OT world. So we've got logic controllers with Ethernet ports built into them. A lot of them have TCP IP stacks built into them. Our OT engineers are starting to figure out how TCP IP works, how IP addressing works. But there's a whole bunch of other technology out there today that's used to make the internet run the way it runs. There's things called RESTful APIs, which are they're basically the building blocks of the internet as you know it today. So when you open up your smartphone and you connect into, say, your home baking application, there's an API behind that application talking to a web server somewhere, and that's how they communicate. That's how they share data. That's how they share resources. It's all through these APIs. They're application program interfaces. And when we say they're RESTful, that's a certain type of API uh, that's most commonly used on the internet. Now, when we transport data, across the internet. We don't use Ethernet IP or Modbus TCP or any of the other automation protocols. We use things like HTTPS. We use things like TCP IP. They're not application specific. They're not proprietary. They're open protocols and we use open languages. If you look at the kids coming out of school right now, they don't come out of school with a computer science degree knowing how to program in ladder logic. They know how to program in things like JavaScript, Node.js. They use tools like Node-RED on these little Raspberry Pi boards to quickly prototype and throw together applications that do really cool stuff that talk to all kinds of other applications. So when we, when we think about the, the folks that are coming up into their careers, these are the kinds of languages and technologies that we have to start adding into our hardware or software. And MQTT, so I'm an ex-IT guy. Uh, MQTT is poised to be a really big thing for the industrial automation space, particularly for remote sites. It's just incredibly lightweight, it, it takes up way less bandwidth, it's a really great protocol for what we're trying to do uh, with this stuff. So going back to the convergence problem, as I said, I used to be an IT guy, I'm an OT guy now, uh, so I have some experience on both sides of this equation. And for whatever reason, I never understood it myself, these two groups just don't get along. When you go and you hang out with them, their cultures are totally different, they drink different beer, I don't know. <laughs> but. Uh, Remember, our objective is to get the two groups working together. So how do we do that? How do we bridge that cultural divide? In my experience, they have a single commonality, or at least a single one that I've seen. They're both incredibly concerned about system uptime, right? Because the, the OT person running the manufacturing line, if their stuff goes down, the widget doesn't get produced, it doesn't get shipped, they don't get paid, and the company goes, goes out of business. So that's a significant problem, or maybe a safety system doesn't work right and somebody gets hurt. So they gotta make sure that their systems are up and running all the time. It's very similar on the IT side of the shop also. If you're an IT person and let's say you're responsible for managing a website and your website goes down and that's how you sell your products. All of a sudden your website's down, you lost your digital presence and you're not selling any products anymore. That's a significant problem. So they're both concerned about uptime. They wanna keep things up and running to support the enterprise as best they can. Now, uptime is just a starting point. You've got to get the two groups in a room together to sit down and talk to each other. But I think there's an opportunity for them to help each other because if you think about the IT assets and resources that they use, they're concerned about, let's say, the power going out. They want to make sure their backup generators turn on so that their web server stays up so that they keep shipping products. Do you know who knows a ton of stuff about backup generators and control systems and making sure that stuff actually you know, fires off when it's supposed to? The OT person does. They know control system programs. They know generators and electrical signals and all that stuff. Now on the flip side of that, the OT folks are starting to connect all of their stuff to the internet. 
or maybe even just local area networks. And they're getting really paranoid about network security, which is a really good thing finally, because the majority of the stuff that's out there right now, the Siemens PLCs, the Allen Bradley PLCs, they weren't designed with internet security in mind. They've got clear text messaging and uh, lack of authentication. So there's a lot of paranoia in the industry right now about computer security, network security, data privacy. But that's okay because do you know who knows a ton about that kind of stuff? Is the IT person. Because they live and breathe the security world. They know about you know, the OSI model and the different security layers that get built into it, authentication, encryption, all that kind of stuff. That's their forte. So. I think if they get in a room and they sit down and they start talking to each other and figuring out how they can increase uptime for each other's systems, I think it's a great place to start. But it's just the starting point. Our objective is not just uptime, our objective is accessing data that we didn't have access to before. That's the whole idea of bridging this OT-IT divide. We want to connect these two groups, get them working together so that we can share data, share resources and information. because. Eventually, the enterprise is going to demand it one way or another, so we're going to have to get on board here at some point in time, whether we like it or not. So just to recap, personally, in my experience, I think the real value of IoT applications, if you want to call it IoT or IoT, is going to come from applications like Nix, where we're actually taking assets that are already out there, leveraging the data that they produce to do something new and innovative, either cut costs or increase profit, whatever we can do. And the hardware and the software to do this stuff, it's already out there. It's already available. You can download a lot of these, these software packages for free and start playing around with them. But remember, the core of this whole IIoT thing, or IoT thing, is all about getting data. We want to get access to data that we didn't have access to before so we can figure out what new problems we can solve with it. So that's all I've got for you guys. <laughs>